I'll sing this out Jesus 
Amen. Aren't we thankful that our God is undefeated? That he's never lost a battle. So even if you're in the middle of the fight right now, you can trust that he's going to come through. So if it takes five minutes or it takes five years, I'm going to wait, going to wait right here. Because if your promise still stands after all I've done, then I can stand on your promise till the fight is won. It's never too late for your love. It's never too late for your power. You are more than enough, God. No matter the hour. Amen. So from the heavens to the earth, the space between. circumstances are grim if the outlook is poor I know that my God is still going to come through I just gotta trust and so I'll say if it's not good you're not done yet if it's not you I don't want it and this will be worth the wait no matter how long it takes say if it's not good God you're not done yet if it's not you I don't want it cause this will be worth the too late. Let's sing it again. If it's not good, you're not done yet. If it's not you, I don't want it. This will be worth the wait. No matter how long it takes, if it's not good, you're not there. If it's not you, I don't want it. No, because this will be worth the wait. I know it's not too late, and it's never too late.
We're so glad that you're here with us, worshiping together. Man, God is good, isn't he? Turn around to somebody next to you, say, welcome to church. Good morning. Great to see you. We're so glad that you're here right now. Well, you may be seated. My name is Chris Van Houten. I'm our lead pastor of Life Groups, and I'm honored to be here leading into our time of giving together. And a verse I want to read to you here is out of 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 and it says this it says as for the rich in this present age which just to be clear is all of us charge them not to be haughty just in case you didn't think it was you uh, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy I think the thing that stands out to me in this verse is the idea that you know if God is the one that we're supposed to put our trust in, how fleeting are we to go to other things, right? Like we're so quick to put our trust in something that isn't him, even if we have the best intent to put it in him. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm learning, and I feel like this is like a weekly thing for me, or maybe even a daily thing, um, my kids are teaching me more about God's word than any other area in my life. So I have an almost two-year-old, and I don't know if she maybe hears a chair move or if she can smell the food. But anytime I sit down to eat something, she arrives. I don't know if this is your experience with your kids. It is not all three of my kids, just one of them. She will run into the room and she doesn't ask. This is so interesting. She doesn't say like, daddy, can I have some? Or you know anything like that. She literally just comes up, sweetly crawls into my lap and then just sits facing the food which is very hard for me to then move the fork from the plate to my mouth without going through her. <laughs> so she has, what is wild, she has positioned herself for something. And isn't that giving? That we position ourselves in a way that we know the Heavenly Father, we know His goodness, we know that He is for us. So then position yourself in your heart and in your actions to say, God, I want your blessings. I want your goodness to flow through and be in his presence, sit with him, take the steps of obedience that he's called us to 
They are good. God is so faithful. And so if you have never given here at Woodlands Church, tithing is giving the first and the best, the 10% that says, God, I trust you more than I trust myself. And so as you give, you can give on the Woodlands Church app. You can download that. You can go to wc.org slash give. But no matter which way you land at the PushPay secure giving platform that we use, that page right there will say, set up a one-time gift or a reoccurring gift. If you're gonna tithe, that's doing this over and over again. That's saying, God, I trust you. And actually every time I get paid, whether that's bi-weekly, monthly, seasonally, I don't know, whatever you get paid, it's choosing to say, God, I trust you more than this, more than myself, more than the things of this world, I put you first. And over and over again, we wanna position ourselves for God's blessing. And so as you give, that will walk you through the next steps of how to do that. You can give cash or check in just a moment with our offering baskets. No matter how you give, it is trusting that God is the one that gave it in the first place. And so let's go to him. God, thank you for your blessings. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, God. We trust you. We put our hopes, our dreams, everything in you and you alone. So use this offering for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as our ushers come forward right now, I want to tell you about uh, just a, a small event coming up. Uh, maybe you have heard. Uh, Easter is two weeks away. Oh my goodness, guys, if that didn't come up really quickly, I don't know, uh, maybe it's just the fact that it's still in March. But either way, we need volunteers. We need you to serve. We need you to come be a part because our hope is that ultimately everyone would have an experience of hearing the gospel this Easter. They need to know the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus has come and offered them. Well, the way for them to do that is to have a great experience, which means we need more people to watch kids. We need more people than ever to be able to stand and greet at the doors, to be able to help in the auditorium, to be able to help on the plaza. We have, uh, if you have not been to a uh, Easter egg hunt here, they last all of 30 seconds. So, I mean, we, we need a lot of help setting up and getting uh, the cleanup afterwards. So, you know, the opportunity to make sure that you're a part of this and saying, I want to serve, I want to be a part of the crew that makes this happen. We need you. So make sure you got this on your way in, this form right here. You can fill this out. You can uh, turn it in on your way out with us, any of our volunteers or any of the pastors in the lobby. We'd love to help make sure you get connected with this. Serve with us. You can serve online. You can sign up there as well. Um, plenty of opportunities. Um, but we also want you to invite because I think that's really important. And so here's what we're telling the community about Easter. Check this out. I'm Pastor Kerry Shuck, and this is my wife, Chris, and we invite you to join us for Easter at Woodland Church. What better time than Easter to mark the start of a new beginning? That's why we're inviting you to join us this Easter at Woodland's Church. You'll enjoy a creative and hope-filled celebration for your whole family, and your kids will love our Texas-sized Easter egg hunts. So come as you are and join us this Easter at Woodland's Church. So yeah, if you're inviting a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, a family member, the thing that I would tell you right now is start praying about them. Start praying for them, praying that God would give you that opportunity to invite. Um, and if you wanna grab one of these yard signs on your way out, that is uh, an easy way to make sure that people know what's happening here at Woodlands Church, as well as just being intentional. So go ask, make sure that, you know, if that God puts somebody on your heart over the next two weeks, be intentional, invite them. It could be a friend, coworker, neighbor, whoever, somebody you come in contact with often, but the opportunity for them to hear the gospel this Easter is what we're all about. That's why we exist as a church. And so be intentional with us inviting and, in, and bringing in the community this Easter. Well, Pastor Mark Miller is gonna be bringing the message this weekend. It is in the series, Marriage Masterpiece, and you are in for a powerful word. And so I'm so glad you're here with us. Prepare your hearts for what God's gonna do. Let's stand and continue to worship together. Why do I 
talk myself out of seeing miracles Cause you are more than able Cause you are more than That you are more than able Yes, you are, God You are more than able Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Yeah, who am I? Oh, I can't deny Can we imagine with all the faith in the room what the Lord can do? It's crazy. It's like, we know that and we sing that, but what if it's beyond what we can even imagine? I think that's what God wants to show us in his word today. That he wants to show us that whatever it is that you've been longing for to see come to pass in your marriage or in your relationship with your kids or in your relationship with a loved one or a friend, something that you're longing to see change in your workplace? Can you imagine what the Lord can do with all the faith in the room? 
there's a miracle on the way. And what's crazy, and this is the part that I think God's gonna really hone in on today in his word is, he wants to bring that miracle about through your faith. That's crazy. Let's pray, God, we love you and we believe you. And God, we proclaim in faith that you are truly more than able to do above all we could think, dream, or imagine. And yet, God, for whatever reason, you have chosen to do those crazy, amazing, wonderful things through us. I don't, can't quite wrap my head around why that is, God, but I love you for it. And I pray that there would just be a hope that just floods and fills this room as we learn to just completely, with reckless abandonment, put our trust in you and in you alone. We love you and we choose you. It's in your sons and we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, what a, what a crazy thing when we think about what it is that we really want and the things that we desire to see God to do in, in our relationships. And I'm sure it would be so nice to have some sort of relationship insurance that would match the insurance that we have for everything else in life, right? We've got health insurance, we've got life insurance, we've got car insurance that seems to be insurance for everything. You buy a TV, they wanna know if you want insurance. I was at Walmart the other day buying a bike for my kids and they asked me if I wanted two years of insurance on my kid's bike. I mean, there's insurance for everything, right? And it's something about it. It's like, we want that in our hearts. It's like, if I'm gonna invest this amount of money and if I'm gonna invest this amount of resources into that, I wanna know that if something goes wrong, I can get my money back or it'll be repaired, it'll be fulfilled. If this thing's not fulfilling to my life, I wanna know I can bring it back, right? Without question, that's why we love Costco because you can take anything back, right? Like what, whatever it is, we long for the insurance of being able to know that it's gonna be fulfilling, it's gonna get us what we want or we can get what we invested into it back. And yet, for the thing that is the most near and dear to our heart, our relationships, there's no insurance for that, is there? I mean, there are people who try it, right? With the principle of a prenuptial agreement, but like that doesn't feel right, right? Like I'm gonna try to do some sort of insurance, like, hey, I'm in it till death do us part, but could you just sign this real quick, right? Like there's some principles as to like, man, people are even trying to do this, but you know it doesn't work. But on some level, we almost wish that was there because we're constantly putting our heart out there on the line in our relationship with our spouse or our loved ones or people we're coming in contact with or our children. We're longing for insurance, but none exists. And yet Jesus shows us throughout all of scripture that relationships are still worth investing it all into. It's worth it all. And in the book of John chapter one, John, the disciple of Jesus who was close to him, basically explained to us in John chapter one how Jesus, who he describes as the word, who was in the beginning was, was God, was with God, who created all things, that Jesus had this passion, this desire to be able to demonstrate to us the value of investing it all into relationships. So would you stand with me in honor of God's word? And let's just look at one of those verses in John chapter one, John chapter one, verse 14, and just consider how much Jesus was willing to invest into relationships. It says this in John chapter one, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. You may be seated. You know, as I read that passage and I just take time to think about Jesus and who he was and what he was doing when he was willing to put flesh on. And it just compels me to stop and to ask the Lord and to ask the Lord on behalf of myself and behalf of all of us to say, God, would you show us what matters? Show me what really matters. Help me be able to focus in on my relationships in a way that matters. God, help me when it comes to my time to be able to really be able to dial in to what matters on what I should be doing in my marriage and what I should be doing with my kids and how I should spend my time most wisely. God, show me what matters and whether it's wise to watch that show or whether or not it's wise if I look at my screen time to see the amount of hours I'm spending on my phone every day. Like, God, show me what really matters because God, I wanna see you bring about a masterpiece and we've been talking about marriage masterpiece, but every message that we've gone through in this series is really tied to every relationship in our lives. 
and we're longing to see the Lord bring about a masterpiece in our relationships, the relationships that for the most part, we've made a mess out of, and we're asking him to turn into a masterpiece. But you know, when I think about seeing what Jesus was willing to do in order to establish a relationship with us, it makes me pause and wonder if the real masterpiece that Jesus is working on is your faith. What if that's the real masterpiece? What if that's the thing that God is constantly working on and addressing and working through? You know, we've been looking at all different types of artists over the last few weeks and some of the most incredible paintings throughout history and through time. And recently I was really thinking about when it comes to relationship insurance, the reason we want insurance is because what we don't want is we don't wanna settle for some sort of relational forgery. Right? We don't wanna be uh, able to be frauded when it comes to what we're investing into. We don't wanna settle for something less than something great and something amazing. But when, it, when I, I was there, and so I came, I started looking for forgeries and came across a famous forger whose name was Han van Meerhan. And Han van Meerhan had an interesting position as far as understanding what really mattered and what value there was. Now he was Dutch and, and there was a famous Dutch painter that we're more familiar with whose name is Vermeer. And Vermeer, Pastor Jordan actually did a message a few weeks ago about a painting called The Girl with the Pearl Earring. And Vermeer was an incredible artist who had done paintings of great value. And yet there was believed to be a time period where he really painted religious paintings and yet that most of those paintings had disappeared. So Han van Meerhan said, ha ha, here's what I'm gonna do because he had some artistic skill. He started painting duplicates of what he believed to look like what Vermeer would have painted in these religious paintings, okay? So first of all, here's a real Vermeer, okay? And this is what it would have looked like. This is a Vermeer, Johannes Vermeer painted this painting. It's Christ with Mary and Martha and the house of Mary and Martha. And, and it's, that's a Vermeer. And, and so he looked at this and said, I think I can turn a profit by being able to create some forgeries. And so he painted some that he believed looked like Vermeer. This is one of them right here. This is the last supper on the road to Emmaus. Now, I don't know if you look at the last one and the previous one, but they don't really look that much alike to me, but Vermeer, I'm sorry, uh, Vermeer and uh, Han von Meerhan had deceived the entire art world. So much so that when Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands, Han, Veer, Han uh, Ver, Van Meerhan, sorry, I'm getting mixed up on these names. Van Meerhan had these paintings and when the Germans invaded the Netherlands, Van Meerhan had an opportunity to be able to make things work easier for himself. He saw an opportunity to sell his forged paintings to the Germans as real Vermeers and did and made a lot of money on it, but also was able to buy back hundreds of other uh, Dutch artifacts and paintings and collectibles in, in exchange for these forgeries. Now, the only problem was once the allied forces had moved in and took over and, and won the war, the Dutch government began to go back through and to be able to examine people who had collaborated with the German government. And so Han van Meerhan was now brought up on charges of treason for having sold priceless Vermeers to the Germans. That were forgeries. So now he was caught in a pickle. Did he admit that he had forged all of these paintings? Or did he go to prison and risk his life on charges of treason? And so while he was awaiting his trial, he spent a year in jail until finally he admitted to the jailers, hey, do you guys really think I would have sold a priceless Vermeer to the German forces? No, I forged them. To which of course the, pris the prison guards did not believe him. So finally he had a plan. He said, would you bring in some reporters and some court witnesses and I will demonstrate how I am the one who is able to paint the forged Vermeers, and so he did. And he got, once it finally realized that his life was on the line, he got his sentence reduced from death, the death penalty, to one year in prison. But here's the sad part, he died while he was in jail. It's crazy, right? How did he lose sight of what, that, what, what really mattered in his life? He was so willing to hold on to a lie because he lost sight of what really mattered until his life was actually on the line. And then finally he brought forward the truth. And if there's one thing that we can learn about relationships that Jesus shows us is that value is everything. If you're gonna really be able to 
put your faith and make an investment into the relationships that the Lord has for you. Value is everything. What is it that you value? How much do you really value your marriage? How much do you really value your relationships with your kids or your coworkers or loved ones or extended family members? What is it that you value? Jesus demonstrated in John 1, 14 what it is that he really valued. Just do you remember what it says when it says the word Jesus became flesh? Why? Because he valued us. Now, this is something that I have such an interesting thing trying to wrap my mind around of just how much Jesus valued relationships. Because we remember that, yes, the word Jesus became flesh. He was fully God and fully man. He had all of the power. And yet we see that Jesus valued relationships so much, first and foremost with the Father and with his spirit, that he was obedient in in his life unto death on a cross out of his love for the Father. And he allowed his life to be led by the Spirit because he valued his relationship with the Father and with the Spirit. But then when you go a little further, let's just remember that Jesus, though he was fully God and had all the power, we have to ask ourselves these questions. Why did Jesus continue to choose to work through relationships? Do you remember his 12 disciples? Why did he pick them at all? Why did he choose to work through them? Do you remember when he sent them out in pairs and and sent them from town to town, casting out demons and healing the sick? If Jesus was fully God, why didn't he just go to those towns and work all those miracles? And yet he chose to work through the 12. And then when Jesus died and was buried and was resurrected, eventually he met with his disciples and passed along to them the great commission to go therefore into all the nations around them, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you're the resurrected Lord. Why didn't you just stay on the earth and continue to go around and to do the ministry? And why aren't you here today? Because for some reason, Jesus has decided to work his greatest miracle through us. Just like he did his disciples, he passed the work along to them. Jesus valued his relationship with the disciples. He also valued his relationships with the crowds. He fed them, he healed them, he spoke to them, he worked through them. And of course, we know that Jesus valued the children. Remember when the disciples tried to shoo the children away and Jesus said, don't you dare do that. Let the little children come to me. And of course, we know Jesus valued relationships with the lost. Whether it was Nicodemus or Zacchaeus or the woman caught in adultery, Jesus showed us what really mattered and what we should value. In fact, when we look into the Old Testament, There was a king of King Solomon who was the son of David and God was greatly pleased with Solomon. So he asked Solomon, what is it that you want? And Solomon had the wisdom when offered anything by God to ask for God's wisdom to be able to rule his people. And a short time later, there was two women who were brought before King Solomon. And the story was, was that each of the women had had a baby at about the same time. And during the night, one of the babies had passed away. And the woman whose baby had passed away had gone and stolen the baby of the woman who was sleeping and had had it and exchanged the babies. So when they woke up, they both were laying claim that the baby that was still alive was theirs and the baby that had passed away was the others. And so here's Solomon and he's got these two moms who are in front of him and he's trying to figure out what's going on. And from God's wisdom, here's what he said. He asked one of his officials, go get me a sword because here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna cut this baby in half and give one half to one mom and one half to the other mom. And of course, one mom screamed out and said, no, I would rather this baby go to the other one than to, for, for that baby to be put to death. And the other mom said, sounds like a good deal to me. She gets half, I get half. It didn't take a whole lot of wisdom moving forward from that point for Solomon to say, we don't need the sword. Give the baby to the mom who was willing to give it up. Why? Because what we love is demonstrated by what we're willing to sacrifice for it. This was demonstrated for all of you who did get married when you were getting engaged, right? And the principle of the engagement ring that you purchased. There was a great sacrifice of three or four month salary or more that went into that. I hope. <laughs> Because what, why, what is it symbolizing? It's when we are willing to put a sacrifice, a financial sacrifice behind that, it's demonstrating what we value and what we love. So why don't we do that more often in relationships? What keeps us from investing completely into relationships the way that Jesus has? Because you know the truth of it. 
that when you invest into relationships as you have in the past, you are sure to get hurt. You know that hurt is on the way. If you open up your heart and you reveal yourself and the intimate details and you're vulnerable with your spouse or your kids or um, your coworkers or your church, your life group, you know that the potential for getting hurt is there. This reminds me a lot of a book that Pastor Carey actually recommended for our whole church called The Knight in Rusty Armor. And the story of the knight in rusty armor is that there was a brave, heroic man who in order to save his family and to protect his town, put on his armor and went out and won many a heroic battles. He fought dragons, he rescued damsels in distress. And when he was out, he was out a lot on rescue missions on behalf of the town. And the problem was is that he was out so much on nightly duty that he began to neglect his duty of being a husband and a father to his son at home. Because when he came home from his nightly escapades, he had nightly duties and nightly affairs of giving reports and updating people on what things that were going on. And so he got accustomed to constantly having on his nightly armor to protect himself from getting hurt. He got so accustomed to it that it began to become his identity that even when he was at home, he would continue to wear that armor. Because why? Because he knew that in taking it off, he was risking getting hurt. Of course, the story goes that the knight in rusty armor began to realize the disconnect that was happening between him and his spouse and his kids. So he goes to take off his armor, but he can't because it's become his identity. He's had it on so long that it's become stuck to him. And he has to go on the journey of learning and going through what's necessary of trying to figure out and going to the people who can help him to be able to take off that armor so that it can melt away and it can begin to connect on a real level again. And some of us, you know that that describes you. You're a knight in rusty armor. You are a leader of leaders and you have learned how to lead out in our community and you're heroic and everything looks good in your life and in your marriage from the outside. But on the inside, you're just as guarded and as protected as you are when you're leading out and doing the heroic things in your business, or in your field, or in your athletics, or whatever it is, you have found something to hide behind. And it's keeping you from being connected. Why? Because you know that if you learn to peel back your heart and be sincere with your spouse, to be sincere with your kids, to be sincere with your parents, that you risk getting hurt. But don't let fear drive us. We have to remember what we value. Jesus knew what was most valuable, and he knew how that could drive away fear when we remember just how great a connected relationship is. Don't quit investing into trust, it's worth it. Just listen to what John taught us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says this, there is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Woo. Since fear is crippling, isn't that the case? Since it is crippling, then a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. You see, if you aren't regularly taking off your armor and putting yourself in the position of risking getting hurt, there's only one reason. It's because you have forgotten how good being loved is. You have forgotten how what you got into that relationship in for the first place. You've forgotten the the power of the dream that God has put in your heart of having a connected relationship with him, a connected relationship with your spouse, a connected relationship with your kids, and that has not become the priority as much as protecting yourself has. And we can't live from that fear. We have to remember what we value. And when you know what you value, you're willing to get into it. Because if I wanted to know how valuable a painting is, at some point, I gotta get into the field. I gotta be able to, if I wanted to know that I wasn't getting ripped off on some sort of valuable painting that I was purchasing, if I wanted to know that, that I wasn't settling for a forgery, at some point, I'd have to get into the field and begin to learn the techniques of, of what something is when it's, when it's real and what this looks like, and I'd have to really get into it. Because right now, when it comes to artwork at least, I would easily be fooled, because I have no expertise because I'm not in the field. And one of the things is, is when you know what you value, you're willing to get into the field. Listen to what Jesus said about himself in John chapter one, verse 14. It says this, and then Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He got into it with us. You see, but before we can really appreciate how loved 
we were when he made his dwelling among us, we have to take time to just consider for a moment what he gave up. Can we remember that before Jesus came and was born in a manger, that what we celebrate at Christmas, that while he was in heaven with the Father and with the Spirit, he lacked nothing. And yet he had created everything from his power. He was totally fulfilled in his relationship with the Father and with the Spirit and needed nothing. And yet the Father loved us and the Son loved the Father. And so the Son came and the Father sent the Son. And even though they were fully fulfilled and lacking nothing and needing nothing, he still came and made his dwelling among us. Why? Because he loves us. It's what we do when we love one another. We get into what matters to each other. I have a brother who lives in North Carolina who I love deeply and growing up, he was very proficient in a lot of sports, basketball and baseball and soccer. And we were a very athletic family. And so of course his kids uh, eventually ended up at a private school there in North Carolina. And he was excited to see what kind of sport they were gonna choose so he could get behind it and bring his expertise into it. And wouldn't you know it that his girls picked field hockey. <laughs> Do you know anything about field hockey? I definitely didn't until they got into it, right? And it was crazy because I watched my brother as there was this area of their life that they were beginning to become passionate about and he just poured himself into it. He became their coach and he began to study and figure out what it looked like to be, to be a field hockey player. He had never played field hockey before in his life nor seen a field hockey game until his kids started playing it but he got invested into it. He started following them after it. And when their friends started to become other field hockey players, he dove in even more and started to travel with them and allow them to be places where field hockey was happening. Why? Because he loved them and he got into the field. It's what he did and he found their passion. He connected with them because it was worth it. Because as the Bible reminds us, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you're investing your time, where you're investing your resources and where you're willing to be real demonstrates what really matters to you. And we don't have to look any further for an example than the example of Jesus, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. There's something to that. And because of it, he could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there and the place of honor right alongside God. You see, we have the example of Jesus who showed us how to invest into what really matters. And when you get into the field, when you're really in it with someone, if you really value that relationship and you wanna maintain and allow that relationship the opportunity to grow, once you get into the field, if just like a painting that you have, if you're gonna get it insured, one of the things that you have to be able to do with the insurance agency is be honest about what you have. We have to learn to be honest. If we really value our relationships, we need to be able to be honest with our spouse about where we really are. We need to be honest with our church about where our relationship with our spouse really is. Because if we're gonna fight for that relationship, if we're gonna bring value to it, we gotta be honest about what it is that we have in the first place. And that's hard to do. But listen to what it says about Jesus in John 1:14 that Jesus, remember when he came, was full of grace and truth. He was kind and compassionate and forgiving, but he was also honest. He was real. We need to be able to be authentic about where our hurts and our struggles really are. We can't build on something that, we can't build something that is real if we don't start with an appreciation of what's really there in our hearts. Just listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, 15. It says this, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. When we learn to speak the truth in love, we begin to become more and more like Christ. And therefore we begin to experience the fulfillment that Christ created us for. We have to learn to speak the truth to our spouse about 
what's going on in our marriage that is really impacting us and hurting us. We also have to learn to speak the truth to our spouse about us and about where our weaknesses are and our vulnerabilities are. We have to be willing to speak the truth in love to our church and to our life groups about where our hurts are and and what things that are happening that aren't helping us to meet those needs that are in our hearts. We have to learn to speak the truth in love. We have to just be authentic. We have to be real. And if you value relationships in the way that Jesus valued relationships, then of course we will. But it's not just about speaking the truth in love. Sometimes what it is about being able to really live in love and be honest, if we're gonna have an honest, open relationship, it's not just about what you speak, it's also about learning to listen. There's a really powerful passage in scripture that I hate a whole lot. It says this in Proverbs 17, 28. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. With their mouths shut, (laughs) they seem intelligent. Isn't it funny that one of the most important things that we can do in the relationships that we value is learn to just be quiet and to learn to trust God and to learn to really engage and connect and allow that person to peel back their armor and speak what they need to speak to us, no matter how much it may hurt. If we want what's real, we also have to learn to listen. You see, identifying a forgery may be hard, but identifying the needs in a relationship, identifying and being able to have relationship ID, being able to ID what's what's good and what's real is important too. We gotta have the right kind of identification to be able to identify what's really going on. And if you're gonna do that, I got a little mnemonic for you, ID, right? We gotta ID what's good. First thing you gotta be able to do, if you wanna really be able to have a healthy relationship, first you have to be able to identify the need. Do you know what your spouse's deepest need is? Have you stopped and peeled back your heart and given them the opportunity to answer that question knowing that it may not shed you in a real good light? Do you know what your kid's deepest need is? Kids, do you know what your parents' deepest need is? Are we invested in each other's lives to take time to say, what is it that you value? What is your deepest need? I want to identify your deepest need. And then the D is we gotta discover the dream together. Because I have seen a lot of marriages in my time here serving at Woodlands Church. And not one of them that is in trouble or in, in, on shaky ground could say back to me that, you know what? This is the dream though. When we got married, the dream was when we first said our, our vows, we looked at each other and we said, you know what? We can't wait for this thing to fall apart in two years. It's gonna be so good. This thing, man, it's gonna be so good in two years. And you know what? <laughs> I've never met a parent who said, you know what? I can't wait to have this kid. And then, oh, I just can't wait for the rebellious teenage years. Woo! When I'm gonna be so frustrated with them and living in anger, that's the dream. I can't wait for it. I've, in all of my times in student ministry, talking with kids who've got a, 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 a struggling relationship with mom or dad or an absent relationship, I've never met one kid who said, you know what, but I'm living the dream. This is what it's all about. Just can't wait till I have kids one day and I gotta be like, this is why we don't go talk to grandpa and grandma. It's not the dream. How do we rediscover the dream? Of course we want forever, everlasting relationships. Of course your kids have a longing to have a deep connected relationship with you. Of course you wanna be able to work through that hurt with your teenager and figure out what their core of their core is and be able to have the kind of deep connection that you were dreaming for when you brought them into this world. And of course Jesus wants a deep connected relationship with you, which is what he did and he demonstrated when he gave his life for you on the cross. Of course we want those things. But if we're gonna rediscover that dream together, we gotta be able to identify the needs that are in our hearts. And if we're gonna get there, we gotta be able to call on the expertise of Christ. You see, at some point, you gotta call on the expert. If I was gonna really be able to make sure that I knew what valued, I'm gonna bring in an expert who's gonna help me be able to see what I should invest into. And we know that Jesus is that expert because all good things come from God. Just listen to what it says in 1 John 1, 14. Remember this part of the passage when it says, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. You see, Jesus was good, like everything else good in our life, because he came from the Father. This reminds me that anything good that is gonna come from my relationships first has to come from the Father. In other words, (laughs) before I speak whatever wisdom I may think I have into an argument, 
I better first stop and run it by the expert God. Can you just imagine how much our relationships would look better today if in every conflict we would make sure that we had put into practice stopping and asking God before we spoke? How many words do we wish we could have back? How many actions do we wish we could take back? Why? Because we didn't call upon the expert. We lived upon our own expertise. Don't do it. Call on the expert. Let's make a good habit of allowing accountability in our lives through things like life groups and close brothers and sisters in Christ who compel us and challenge us to stop and think and call upon Jesus before we act and let him guide us to what's good. Because Jeremiah 33.3 offers a powerful appreciation as to why we should do this. If you have not allowed this scripture to be hidden in your heart, I hope that you will. Just listen to what it says. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Don't you know that whatever relationship it is that you're hoping to see get to the next level, that God knows exactly what is in the other person's heart? And if they're a believer like you're a believer, then God's spirit that lives in you also lives in them. And he wants to tell you the unsearchable things of their heart but we need him, call to him. This relates to things outside of the marriage bedroom and inside the marriage bedroom. He knows what makes your spouse tick. And he says, call to me and I will answer you. You're trying to figure out how to repair and restore that relationship with your teenager? Call to me and I will answer you. And even if they don't have God's spirit inside of them, he says, call to me and I will teach you how to love them that will soften their heart and give us the greatest opportunity to see life change come to pass in them. You gotta call on me and let me guide you on how to speak and what to do. But it's hard to do because we know that sometimes the things that God calls us to do don't seem to make sense to us. And therefore choosing to let God work through us is hard. I'll never forget when my prayer life went to the next level. It was around Christmas time and uh, my sister was pregnant with child and as was a common thing in my household, my dad has 33 grand- grandchildren, so someone's pregnant in our family all the time, okay? And so it was Christmas time and my sister was pregnant with her third, she has 11, by the way, um, and she was pregnant with her third and all of a sudden we were at our Christmas festivities and before I knew it, she was rushing out of the house with my brother-in-law and they were on their way to the emergency room because she was starting to have the signs that she was potentially having a miscarriage. So we all got together and we prayed. A few hours later, she came home and all of my sisters met her at the front door and ushered into the front room and there was just tears all over the place. She began to reveal to me that it was obvious that the child had passed. A few weeks later, I'm driving in my truck on the way to work. And I get one of those nudges from the Lord. And he says, I want you to call your sister. I want you to tell her that you're praying for that child that's in her belly. I was like, God, are you feeling cruel today? Like what's going on? Like this must, this this is what makes it so hard sometimes to be able to discern. Like, is this just a, from my own evil heart? Could this possibly be from God? To call and make her have to relive what she lost and to make her feel like I'm not just connected to what, connected to what happened to her. So the Lord and I just have this wrestling match in our thoughts. He's like, call. I'm like, no. He's like, call. I'm like, no. And he just won't let go. I was listening to worship music. That's always a mistake when you're trying to say no to God, you know? So eventually I picked up the phone and made a call. Now here's the thing you need to know before I ever make this call. The child had never passed away. Guys just don't do real good on communication, okay? I just left on an assumption that the child had passed. So the only person who's in desperate fear right now is me. I make the phone call and she picks up, right? Though I was praying, God, if ever there was a time to go to voicemail, please let it be now. (laughs) She picks up. I say, hey, she goes, hey, Marky. No one gets to call me Marky, by the way, just her. Okay, just so we're clear, just. She 
she goes, is something wrong? Obviously we don't talk enough, okay? I say, no, nothing's wrong. I'm just calling. One last time, God, are you sure? I'm just calling to tell you that I'm praying for your baby. She goes, great, thank you so much. I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? She goes, yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Why, why, why are you so trepid in your voice? Like, what's going on? I said, I thought your baby passed away. And I've been fighting with the Lord for like 10 minutes to even make this phone call. She says, why did you think that? I was like, because y'all all were crying in the front room at Christmas. She's like, yeah, I was scared, but everything was fine. I was like, well, God really loves your baby. Bye. <laughs> Guys, I've never been so ready to pray after that in my life. I was like, God, what's next? Let's go. Who do you want me to call? I don't care how crazy it sounds. Let's go. Here's the crazy thing. God wants to work miracles through our church. And there are miracles on the way, but this is the part I can't quite wrap my mind around. For whatever reason, God has decided that he wants to bring those miracles about through your faith. What? God says, that's right, I wanna bring that miracle in your marriage, so pray to me and let's do it together. I wanna restore that relationship between you and your teenager, so get on your knees and let's bring it to pass together. I wanna see something incredible happen in your parents' life and in your extended family's life. I wanna do something amazing, but I'm not just gonna snap my fingers and do it. I choose to do it with you and through you because that's how good our God is. That's what is possible with all the faith in the room because he is more than able to do the things that you've been praying for. And he says, if you value it, then get on your knees and chase after me. And maybe, just maybe, the great thing that I wanna do is something relational between me and you, but you'll never know if you don't journey with me into what's coming. Can we imagine what's possible with all the faith in the room? So let's get on our knees and let's put our trust in God and let's let him do whatever it is that he wants to do through us. Let's do it together as a church, amen, come on.
love you so much, Woodlands Church. Thank you for worshiping with us. Go have an amazing week, and we will see you next weekend.